Welcome to the 27th lecture of uh, surface engineering course. Um, we have, uh, in the last few lectures, uh, we have discussed uh, one specific approach of uh, thermochemical surface modification or surface engineering of steel primarily, uh, which uh, is based on introduction of carbon enriching the uh, surface with carbon from mild steel level of about 0.2 percent carbon to all the way to 0.6-0.8 percent carbon. And this uh, typical case depth uh, was in those cases uh, anything from uh, uh, less than a millimeter, few hundred micrometers to uh, almost as high as five or six millimeter. The entire strategy is based on the uh, principle of uh, enriching carbon so that uh, on subsequent heat treatment when martensite is formed, that martensite will have sufficient hardness and, wear, and offer uh, adequate wear resistance. Uh, surface hardening or um, improving the mechanical properties onto the surface both in terms of uh, hardness, wear resistance, um, uh, frictional coefficient, uh, erosion resistance and several other mechanical interaction processes. To improve upon the steel component, there is another strategy which is uh, in some respect uh, uh, actually offers even higher hardness or higher mechanical properties and actually also makes the surface fairly passive uh, against corrosive attack, but uh, has certain uh, other limitations uh, which is why carburizing is uh, very widely used. Um, so the technique that I am referring to is based on introduction of nitrogen instead of carbon. So today we are going to discuss uh, uh, nitriding of steel and uh, in particular uh, gas nitriding. So first of all, uh, as I said, nitriding essentially means we are going to enrich the surface of steel with uh, nitrogen and obviously nitrogen is one of those uh, four elements which are fairly small to be able to uh, find a place in the interstices of uh, alpha iron or um, BCC iron. Um, for example, we all know that uh, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are the elements which easily uh, can be accommodated in the interstices. So this uh, technique is all about introducing nitrogen in the interstices of steel at the surface up to a certain depth. Uh, this is a diffusion control process thermally activated, so it is uh, usually conducted at elevated temperature. Now uh, there is a subtle difference uh, and in fact a very significant difference uh, between uh, the approach based on carbon and approach based on nitrogen. So when we actually introduce nitrogen, nitrogen actually chemically reacts and forms a series of intermetallic compounds and they are called nitrites. So uh, the entire process of uh, nitriding is based not on solid solution strengthening and subsequently formation of uh, supersaturated solid solution. But here, of course, uh, nitrogen gets dissolved up to a certain extent, but principally the entire process is based on formation of a series of nitrides. Uh, so the nitrided case actually is harder than even tool steels or carburized steels. So in that respect, actually, you derive a, a greater advantage, but we'll realize that this is not always uh, an advantage that we want. Um, this treatment uh, typically is done in the ferritic range. So that means we are talking about uh, in terms of the, um, again, the uh, eutectoid part of the iron, iron carbon diagram. We are talking about uh, the um, temperature range, which is um, uh, which is below the eutectoid temperature. So this is A1. And we are talking about a typical treatment range, which will be um, ideally uh, let's say about 480, 90 to about 550 or so. So typically in this temperature range. Now, um, this is important for us to make a distinction. Why we choose uh, the ferritic range and not austenitic range? In case of carburizing, we were very clear that we would always like to go to single phase gamma region because gamma offers you to accommodate carbon uh, to the tune of almost 2 percent. Whereas uh, uh, we know very well that in, in ferritic range, in ferritic zone, uh, 
the maximum solubility of carbon is 0 0.025, but of course, it can accommodate uh, slightly uh, almost a similar amount of uh, nitrogen or maybe even a little less. Then why do we prefer um, a a nitriding to be conducted in the ferritic zone? This is primarily because the strengthening mechanism is not, as I said just a few minutes ago, the strengthening mechanism is not based on formation of solute supersaturation, but it is based on formation of compounds, the nitrides. So, solubility is not the criterion. What is even uh, more important in this case is the ability to diffuse. So, since diffusion is faster in the BCC uh, iron, we would prefer to conduct uh, all the uh, treatments in the ferritic range though the solubility is lower. We are aware of that. Now, um, if steel contains alloying elements like uh, aluminum, chromium, molybdenum, vanadium, these are titanium. So, these are the elements which actually are known to be strong nitrate formers. So, we would prefer to do it either in plain carbon steel or alloy steels containing one of these alloying elements. The temperature I just now mentioned would be typically about uh, close to 500 to 550 uh, in the ferritic zone. And the most important reaction, which is the key for nitriding, is uh, dissociation of ammonia into um, a nascent nitrogen and hydrogen. Uh, though I mention only about ammonia, I must also clarify that typically nitriding gas mixture will always con contain hydrogen along with ammonia. In fact, the amount of hydrogen is much higher than nitrogen. Typically, a gas mixture would have anything like 80, 20 um, or even maybe 90 or 95 percent by volume of hydrogen. So, more amount of hydrogen because hydrogen actually uh, creates uh, the uh, situation whereby the surface oxide gets reduced easily and nitrogen can uh, move in. In fact, there is also um, a school of thought which believes that actually hydrogen helps in creation of a thin plasma which actually removes all the scale or oxides. So, here is a process where we, we can actually achieve extremely high hardness, much higher. So, typically in terms of uh, weaker, the weakest number, it will be anything like 950 to 1000 weakest number and in terms of um, uh, Rockwell RC, we are talking about uh, easily uh, something like 70 or even 75 HRC. So, very high hardness. The depth could be uh, point 0.1 to point 0.6 millimeter, maybe close to a millimeter. Um, and applications actually cover a very wide range of component based on steel. The gear components, the valves, the cutters or various kinds of slicing equipment, sprockets. Uh, boring tools, uh, pump, pump devices, then um, fuel injection pump parts, uh, nozzles, various kinds of applications. And in fact, uh, is very widely used not only for ferritic steel, but also austenitic stainless steel. There are plenty of advantages. So, when we talk of nitriding, we are talking about a large number of advantages and benefits. For example, we of course, uh, derive high wear resistance very high surface hardness, harder than what you can achieve through martensitic hardening. Uh, the coefficient of friction is uh, uh, reduced to a very significant extent, so that uh, the surface is very smooth and does not offer much of um, wear. Uh, we also make the surface fairly passive and the corrosion resistance is uh, improved than uh, uh, native steel. So, uh, steel which otherwise uh, is known to rust very easily after night riding will actually maintain the shining surface to a uh, for a much longer period. Um, it also reflects heat, uh, incident uh, heat wave is reflected because of the very smooth surface and also the compounds that we have on the surface, these nitrided, nitride compounds actually are heat resistant and they have fairly high melting temperature. Uh, much higher than uh, iron itself. Um, there is also an argument that uh, though there is no supersaturation, no formation of martensite, which actually um, uh, causes uh, expansion of the matrix and creation of residual compressive stress, even in nitriding, though, though such kind of mechanisms uh, does not exist, 
mechanisms uh, don't exist. Um, yet, uh, formation of so on the case, if we actually have a rich nitride layer, these nitride co nitride compounds actually have a higher lattice parameter. So in the matrix, which is uh, a BCC iron, if you in the matrix, if you produce now uh, uh, nitrided phases, which actually are uh, having a larger lattice parameter, then uh, so if this is the kind of uh, BCC unit cell you're talking about, a typical hexagonal unit cell of these one of these nitrides would be bigger than this. And if it's bigger than this, then when these uh, actually precipitates form, they tend to uh, deform or create plastic strain, and the reaction to that will mean that on the surface you actually end up creating residual composite stresses or forces which are acting towards each other. This is an advantage. Obviously, because of very high hardness and lowering of friction coefficient, the abrasion resistance is improved. And we also maintain very good dimensional and shape accuracy, because uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion of this nitrided layer is fairly low. So uh, nitriding actually can be achieved through one of these three approaches, salt bath nitriding. But this is kind of a no-go is because uh, they deal with the cyanide bath. So because of the need to deal with cyanide, salt bath nitriding is generally avoided. Gas nitriding is very popular and even more popular and effective is plasma nitriding. So obviously today we are discussing gas nitriding and um, we will soon discuss also uh, this plasma nitriding. So these are the three methods of uh, large scale uh, nitriding operations. Before we go into the actual process, uh, probably it's important that we take a look at the iron nitrogen diagram, not iron carbon diagram or iron cementite diagram. So when we talk of iron nitrogen, that phase diagram would look very similar. So actually, um, but then uh, I mean on the on the uh, pure nitrogen side, you actually will have the same allotropic transformations right from the liquid state. So liquid followed by gamma iron, which is BCC, then sorry, liquid to delta iron, which is BCC with a larger lattice parameter. So delta iron transforms to gamma iron, which is FCC, then gamma iron again transforms back to BCC form, which is beta iron, paramagnetic, and then beta again will transform to alpha iron. So all these uh, allotropic transitions are possible in pure iron. There is no problem with that. But on the other side, what we have is nitrogen. In fact, this diagram is not complete. It is sort of incomplete because uh, the phases that may form beyond about 11, 12 percent of nit nitrogen is uh, not easy to determine. So essentially the phase diagram beyond uh, 11 or 12 percent is uh, never shown. And in fact, this particular um, uh, zeta nitride is actually so hard and so brittle that you cannot form any other higher nitride beyond this. And the entire uh, uh, phase aggregate beyond about 8 percent is already uh, a fairly uh, strong uh, nitride, which is uh, epsilon nitride. So, so we do see an eutectoid transformation here. We have uh, very little amount of formation uh, existence of uh, ferrite here, alpha, and uh, then we have uh, the FCC variety, austenite, and then uh, we have a series of in interstitial compounds, uh, which is uh, gamma, uh, which is ga which can be epsilon, which can be gamma prime. So gamma prime typically forms at, at around. So this is an um, uh, congruent uh, uh, co compound, which has a certain uh, solubility range, not a line compound, but this uh, uh, congruent compound actually is one of the very uh, hard phase. And then we have even harder phases like epsilon carbide or zeta carbides and so on. So the, as we go to higher and higher nitrogen containing uh, region, so these nitrides actually also get richer and richer in nitrogen. So the first uh, 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 interstitial compound that we can think of is this gamma prime, which is typically expressed in terms of Fe4n uh, stoichiometry.
And uh, so, any any time we cross uh, nitrogen content to more than 0.1 percent, up to about 6 percent, we continue to form this um, um, gamma prime phase. And beyond 6 percent, we go into the uh, enter into another regime where we form epsilon uh, nitrites, which is typically Fe 2. Point if we x n and this x can be anything like uh, 2 to 3. Uh, so, as I said this is not a line compound, not a fixed stoichiometry, but a very well stoichiometry compound and x can be anything between 2 to 3 um, uh, weight percent of nitrogen. But if we go beyond, then we may actually uh, create a, or form another nitride, which is the zeta nitride. And this forms typically around 11, 12 weight percent of nitrogen and the stoichiometry is uh, expressed as uh, Fe2n. And as I said, beyond that is uh, a domain which is not useful to any engineering applications and hence is not even shown. So, we must now uh, reposition ourselves and move away from iron carbon and think in terms of iron nitrogen diagram and realize that there is very little solubility of nitrogen in alpha iron. Uh, by the by, um, uh, we, we did uh, uh, ma make a brief mention while discussing about uh, formation of various phases or microstructural evolution in one of the lectures, wherein I did mention that alloying elements in iron or in steel can be divided into three categories, ferrite stabilizers, usually the BCC elements are ferrite stabilizers, austenite stabilizers, usually the FCC elements are austenite stabilizers and a part of the BCC um, uh, elements uh, which have a very strong tendency uh, of formation of carbides are called carbide formers. We also have now another class of elements uh, which we just discussed say for example, chromium, vanadium, um, molybdenum or titanium and uh, many of these elements actually have a tendency of formation of nitride, so nitride forming. But nitrogen per se is itself a austenite stabilizer, is an austenite stabilizer. So, that is the reason why we do not see large solubility of nitrogen in alpha iron, whereas we see a large solubility of nitrogen in either in the form of gamma or gamma prime or epsilon, all these phases are nitrogen containing compounds. So, we do have solid solubility and the solubility is fairly large. But instead of that, we may also have a, a good amount of uh, nitrogen containing compounds. So, we understand that uh, in um, a nitrogen containing system, um, actually, uh, when we introduce nitrogen in steel, we actually tend to stabilize austenite, and uh, beyond the solubility limit, we tend to form various compounds like all these gamma prime, uh, uh, epsilon, and uh, uh, zeta and, and so on and so forth. Now, when we actually nitride, we uh, expect several benefits. We did discuss in one of the previous slides, but let me just quickly repeat. Apart from very high surface hardness, we expect high wear resistance. Uh, we also expect a good in increment in terms of both yield point and uh, tensile strength uh, because of the uh, larger lattice parameter of the phases that we form in the form of nitrides in the matrix, we expect expansion of lattice and as a result of the reaction to that tendency of expansion, we see a compressive residual stress on the surface and also uh, a very, um, I would say, unique uh, effect of uh, introduction of nitrogen, the, the because of which we create the nitrides and these nitrides actually are fairly corrosion resistant. So, we make the surface fairly passive. But as I said that uh, nitrogen also is a desirable alloying element for formation of nitrides on stain in stainless steel, but stainless steel itself is austenitic but and a single phase. But when you introduce nitrogen, we do form certain nitrides for example, chromium nitrides. That is not a good news for stainless steel because chromium nitrides is relatively cathodic compared to the rest of the matrix. So, uh, then uh, we introduce the possibility of uh, because of the creation of two phase microstructure uh, in stainless steel uh, by way of nitriding, where we have uh, where, where we may have chromium nitrides and the uh, uh, matrix which is austenitic. So, these two phase aggregate can actually create a galvanic cell uh, 
because the nitrides happen to be uh, more cathodic than the matrix. So it's not always very um, desirable to nitride stainless steel, particularly when we are anticipating some level of corrosion. Now, we did mention the uh, very um, important or very hard uh, nitride phases possible like gamma prime, then we talk of uh, mentioned about epsilon and then we also uh, talked about zeta nitrides and so on. So, whether it is Fe 2 4 n, Fe 4 n or Fe 2 2 3 n or Fe 2 n, whatever may be the actual nature of these nitrides, the first the topmost layer which will have the maximum concentration of nitrogen may actually contain combination of epsilon and uh, zeta. So, when we have these high nitrides, high nitrides formed onto the surface, the surface becomes completely passive and uh, resistant to any amount of electrochemical etching uh, by uh, virtue of which we create or reveal a microstructure. So, we tend to see a microstructure revealed underneath uh, in the interior of the sample, but the surface layer does not itch at all and as a result, it remains completely resistant, resistant to any chemical attack and hence uh, uh, it reflects any amount of light that is incident on it. In other words, when, I, when we uh, polish etch and take it under the microscope, optical microscope, we see complete reflection of light from the surface and as a result the entire surface appears very bright. So, that is why we call this layer as white layer or bright layer. The white layer essentially means that we have combination of these nitrides and which are completely resistant to any, any uh, chemical attack or electrochemical attack and hence we see uh, a, a surface which is totally bright. But uh, otherwise, uh, we actually uh, typical um, hardened case uh, will be like this, which will have combination of nitrides and the core can still remain uh, unaffected. So, this is uh, the microstructure coming from a particular alloy steel, which contains various uh, nitride forming uh, uh, elements. Um, so, when we uh, actually want to carry a carry out an actual experiment of nitriding, a gas nitriding is one of the most popular and effective methods. So, here we use ammonia as the precursor for introducing nitrogen. Um, as I mentioned right in the beginning, in the nitriding furnace, uh, the ammonia dissociates in this typical temperature range uh, around about 480, 490 to about 550 degrees, 560 degrees centigrade. And that is the optimal range where diffusion coefficient is fairly high and you do not need to heat uh, more than this because uh, within a short distance uh, nitrogen buildup is fairly high to start forming the higher nitrides. So, um, so we have these uh, 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 ammonia as a main precursor, but as I mentioned that we never introduce only ammonia, we actually always mix it with hydrogen and then we feed in. So, um, so, this is the furnace and uh, this is where uh, the reaction takes place, uh, ammonia uh, dissociates, it uh, provides both nitrogen and hydrogen and uh, nitrogen actually uh, gets further uh, dissociated into uh, atomic or nascent form and then gets uh, same way like in case of carburizing, here also nitrogen is adsorbed and then absorbed into the surf, into the interior by way of uh, diffusion. So, we use an uh, uh, either premixed or, or a nit nit uh, ammonia bottle uh, with hydrogen and then we feed in here and uh, we also, uh, so whatever is the gas that is uh, exhaust or um, reacted uh, out output that moves out through this outlet. So, if you expose various kinds of steel, say for example, H11 tool steel, 4140, which is a chromoly steel or nitrilloy steel, which has large number of nitride forming elements. What we see is that uh, 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 typically, if you um, soak for a certain period of time at a given temperature, let us say 500 degrees centigrade. So, um, uh, for a certain period of time, let us say reference time is uh, 20 hours. So, what we realize is that in 20 hours, uh, 
the case depth is uh, minimum in case of H11 tool steel and is lot higher in case of nitro alloy. That is purely because nitro alloy contains composition wise lot of alloying elements like um, chromium and uh, vanadium and so on with manganese and so on which actually forms large number of nitrides. So, the composition of the base steel is important for making the nitriding process uh, very effective. Um, so, we must realize that though the source is uh, uh, ammonia, ammonia at high temperature should dissociate and provide nitrogen and um, uh, hydrogen molecules, but the molecular form is not fit enough to uh, enter into the lattice. So, they need to, so if you have an N2 or a H2 molecule, uh, they actually need to further dissociate and uh, reach the nascent state. So, that now this nitrogen uh, atom is in a position to get absorbed onto the surface layer and subsequently uh, can actually diffuse uh, likewise in, in, in this uh, um, path. Uh, it does not need to substitute or displace any existing lattice atom, it simply finds its way to go into the lattice through the interstitial path. So, these are like interconnected uh, channels through which the nitrogen atoms can move in, but we must realize that though this cartoon shows as if this nitrogen atom is smaller than the interstitial hole available, but actually in reality it is the other way around. The maximum hole diameter whatever we can calculate geometrically is uh, fairly small at least uh, um, the nitrogen atom would be easily uh, 20 to 30 percent bigger in size than the available holes available available size of the hole. So, uh, we actually can carry out nitriding uh, this is using gas, but we can also do in the liquid state or plasma state and, and also create the so called bright and packed nitriding processes. Um, we are for the time being we are discussing gas nitriding and we will uh, shortly afterwards we will discuss liquid or plasma nitriding. Um, this is the typical chamber that we have already discussed and this is how we feed in the premix gas. So, when we carry out this nitriding process as I said the topmost layer on the surface. So, this is the distance from the surface. So, this is the surface layer and this is towards the interior. and um, so, the uh, so the we expect epsilon or epsilon prime at the surface which is Fe 2 to 3 n uh, higher nitride. In, in some cases we may have a very thin layer of even formation of zeta. Um, so, this is the surface layer which is very very rich in uh, ni high nitrogen containing compounds and then gradually the amount of for example, epsilon decreases. Uh, so, we have epsilon, then gamma prime, then uh, alpha nitrogen. This is alpha n means uh, this is uh, alpha iron containing nitrogen. So, interstitial solid solution of nitrogen in alpha iron. And then of course, uh, the matrix which remains unaffected. So, this is solid solution range amount of nitrogen is very low. When we talk of gamma prime typically the formation can be anywhere from about 1 or 2 percent to about 6 percent, 8 percent and between 6 to 8 we do form epsilon and then beyond 8 or beyond 10 and 11 somewhere around 12 percent we form the eta nitrides. So, as a result we create this bright uh, or white layer um, appears very attractive in terms of hardness or mechanical property, but actually is quite detrimental because this is highly brittle. So, this brittle surface is actually no good for any further operation particularly machining or further shaping. In fact, uh, uh, this surface being so hard when it actually interacts with another surface which probably is not as hard as this, this certainly cause, uh, causes damage to the others, other component of the other surface. So, this is a typical hardness profile that we see what we uh, so, this is the nitrogen diffusion profile and this would be typically the hardness profile. And as I said the hardness can be as high as 70 R C or maybe even uh, greater than this, even greater than this. So, we are talking about the depth is very small, we are talking about a depth which is uh, few tens of a micrometer, maybe uh, hundreds of a micrometer. So, less than millimeter for sure. So, uh, now let us try to uh, uh, summarize the discussion so far. Uh, 
So, uh, in this lecture, we actually invoked the possibility of using nitrogen uh, as opposed to carbon uh, as a means of uh, surface strengthening, surface engineering. So, we introduced nitrogen with an intention not necessarily to create a, a martensite, but to create nitrides, which are interstitial compounds of nitrogen in iron. And these nitrides can be stoichiometric, can be off stoichiometric or having interstitial compound or interstitial phase with a certain compositional range. Uh, they are very hard, they are very wear resistant, they are chemically inert and they reduce the friction coefficient. They give you all kinds of uh, desirable properties on the surface of steel. So, apparently they are very, very uh, attractive, but uh, I also mentioned that they can actually make the surface layer fairly brittle, primarily because of the formation of the so-called white layer. So, um, formation of white layer, particularly thick white layer is undesirable, but uh, you cannot avoid formation of some of these epsilon or uh, even some cases the zeta nitrides. Uh, but if they are dispersed in small volume fraction in alpha, there is no problem. But if you have a, a monolith of epsilon or zeta, then that surface can be completely um, uh, very high hardness, but uh, may not be usable at all in practical purpose. So, uh, as far as process parameter is concerned, just like any other diffusion control uh, process, here also the time, temperature, the activity of nitrogen in the atmosphere surrounding atmosphere, uh, then the previous the uh, condition of the uh, surface and of course, the, um, the uh, carbon content and composition of the material that we are subjecting to. So, we generally prefer uh, not only low carbon, even interstitial free carbon or maybe um, a very low amount of uh, carbon containing steel, because otherwise if you already have sufficient amount of carbon present in the interstices then solubility of nitrogen or penetration of nitrogen is even more um, retarded or uh, the possibility even is lower. So, uh, we discussed large number of components, uh, the valves, the springs, the sprocket, not springs, valves, the sprockets, the um, uh, surgical instruments, uh, uh, certain bearings and so on, they are subjected to nitriding. And uh, uh, the useful thing is that uh, while carburizing is uh, solely uh, applicable to steel, nitriding actually can be a very useful method of surface hardening, not only to steel, but also other non-ferrous systems, for example, titanium, for example, even stainless steel or um, molybdenum or um, uh, titanium, molybdenum, vanadium, manganese, uh, base uh, metals and alloys. Thank you very much.